Starship Flight 10 has hit a sudden snag, engineers flagged a faulty engine on Ship 37, forcing a delay and more ground testing. What exactly went wrong? How is SpaceX dealing with it? And what does this mean for the launch timeline? Let's break it all down. In preparation for Flight 10, Ship 37 had completed its two-part static fire campaign on August 1st to validate engine and propellant delivery system performances. The sequence began with a single engine test using propellants from the header tanks to simulate deorbit burn conditions, followed by a six-engine full-duration fire to assess both vacuum and sea-level raptors. After the tests, the ship was removed from the orbital launch mount and returned to the production site for post-fire inspections and Flight 10 preparations. Simultaneously, ground crews began dismantling temporary test hardware from the OLM, including the test stand adapter, which was later sent back to the build site. The booster hold-down clamps were reinstalled, and work started on removing the temporary ship QD system that had supplied propellants, gases, and electrical power during testing. However, during Ship 37's inspections, teams found an issue with one of its Raptor vacuum engines, prompting a replacement. The new engine arrived early Tuesday and was swapped in shortly after, necessitating another static fire before Flight 10 clearance. Engine swaps like this are not new in the Starship program. For context, Ship 35, used in Flight 9, experienced multiple Raptor vacuum issues during its test campaign, including premature shutdowns that led to at least two replacements and a second round of tests. Even after passing, another engine showed abnormal behavior, requiring yet another swap and a follow-up spin prime test before flight clearance. In-flight issues have also been common. Flights 7 and 8 suffered propellant leaks and cascading engine shutdowns, leading to vehicle loss mid-ascent. Flight 9 showed a recurring hotspot on the vacuum engine bell. Although it completed the ascent burn, the incident highlighted ongoing vulnerabilities. And now, once again, Ship 37 is dealing with vacuum engine complications just weeks before launch. These recurring issues, especially with vacuum raptors and their supporting systems, highlight the difficulty of building and operating a reliable, reusable, full-flow stage combustion engine. While Starship's Block 2 architecture includes significant design changes across both engines and vehicle systems, it remains in an iterative phase where reliability is being improved test by test. This sudden change of plan triggered a cascade of activity. The test stand, which had just been removed, had to be returned to the launch site. Ground crews dismantled the hold-down clamps once again, allowing the stand to be craned onto the mount Tuesday afternoon and secured with 20 bolt on adapters. Simultaneously, teams reinstalled the removed propellant feed lines and flexible hoses to reconfigure the temporary QD system for ship engine testing. Ship 37 is expected to return to the launch site soon for additional engine testing. This could involve either a single-engine static fire of the newly installed Raptor or a spin prime test, where the engine's turbo pumps are spun up using inert gas to verify the integrity and performance of the propellant feed systems, including valves, plumbing, and associated hydraulics, without initiating ignition. Once testing is complete, the vehicle will be transported back to the production site for post-test data analysis, detailed system inspections, and final pre-launch checkouts. If all six Raptors pass qualification without issues, the vehicle will be flight-ready, pending a few remaining tasks. Several heat shield tiles are still missing and must be installed. The payload bay will be loaded with a batch of dummy Starlink satellites, serving as mass simulators and test articles for validating the payload deployment system. These will be released into a controlled suborbital trajectory during the coast phase of Flight 10 to test the mechanical deployment system and onboard control logic. Previous dummy payload tests failed due to issues with the deployment doors and actuation systems. For Flight 10, a successful deployment is critical to enabling future launches of operational Starlink V3 satellites aboard Starship. Booster 16, Ship 37's flight partner, was recently relocated to the Rocket Garden from the Mega Bay. It has already completed all pre-flight milestones, including a full-duration static fire and hot staging ring installation, making it flight-ready. Alongside vehicle preparations, SpaceX must undo the modifications made to the launch mount for Starship testing. This includes removing the temporary static fire stand, reinstalling the hold-down clamps, and disassembling the ship-specific QD hardware spliced into the main propellant lines to restore the OLM to its flight configuration. If work continues at this pace, Ship 37 and Booster 16 could roll out within two weeks for full-stack assembly and final launch prep. According to last week's notice to Mariners, SpaceX was initially targeting Flight 10 for no earlier than August 16th. However, the engine anomaly discovered on Ship 37 has pushed the tentative launch date to August 22nd. That said, 
This is merely a provisional target, not a confirmed schedule. As always, the actual launch timing will hinge on both FAA approval and the vehicle's internal readiness. Rebuild operations at the Massey test site are progressing steadily, focused on the methane tank farm and static fire area. The destroyed vertical methane tanks, vaporizers, and pumps have been removed, replaced by a new horizontal tank. New pumps and vaporizers are expected soon. Crews recently removed the destroyed original propellant feed lines that once ran above ground from the methane tank farm to the static fire stand. Excavation has begun for a new underground trench, reinforced with steel rebar, to replace them. This strongly suggests SpaceX is shifting toward a buried propellant transfer system for added protection against future incidents. Adjacent to the trench, a reinforced bunker is being built, likely to house instrumentation and valves, providing both closer access and better shielding than surface-level setups. Inside the flame trench, crews are repairing and replacing the damaged portions of the water-cooled steel pipes of the flame diverter. Outer top panels of the static fire stand have been stripped, signaling an upcoming frame upgrade. Damaged ship hold-down clamps were also removed weeks ago. Meanwhile, at the production site, construction of the Gigabay rocket integration facility is ramping up. Groundwork is in full swing, with pile drilling already completed, and work has begun to install steel rebar cages to reinforce the piles. Next steps include placing pile caps, or a raft foundation to link the piles into a unified base, followed by concrete pouring to form the ground slab. After curing, vertical construction will begin with steel columns, beams, and wall segments, similar to the construction techniques used for the high bay and mega bay facilities, but on a much larger scale. A similar gigabay facility is already under construction at SpaceX Roberts Road facility inside Kennedy Space Center, where the foundation work is currently underway. This site will support East Coast Starship operations from Launch Complex 39A. Over at LC-39A, work on the Starship launch pad continues steadily, with current efforts focused on the tower arms, aiming to bring the massive structure into full operation. With the drawwork cable reeving now complete, chopstick actuation tests are expected soon to evaluate range of motion, load-bearing capacity, and operational precision, all crucial before real launches begin. Just nearby, excavation for the flame trench continues while the overall pad setup is evolving to closely match Starbase's Pad B. Meanwhile, the LC-39A launch mount itself is in the final construction phase at Roberts Road. On August 4, the FAA released the 2025 Draft Environmental Impact Statement for Starship Operations at LC-39A, detailing impacts on the local environment, infrastructure, and stakeholders. The EIS permits up to 44 Starship launches annually, each potentially accompanied by 88 landings, 44 for the booster and 44 for the ship, along with 88 static fire tests per year, split equally between both stages. The FAA also noted that these numbers could increase over time as the vehicle matures and operational reliability improves. A series of graphics included in the report shows how Starship operations will affect nearby pads, particularly United Launch Alliance's SLC-41 and SpaceX's SLC-40. Both will fall within keep-out zones during Starship launches and landings, rendering them temporarily inactive during those periods. Defined launch azimuths, the allowable trajectory angles, between 40 and 115 degrees allow Starship to target a wide variety of orbital inclinations. Alongside this, the FAA has mapped out airspace closures and sea hazard zones for both launch and landing operations, the EIS confirms that ocean-based landings will remain an option, utilizing drone ships stationed in the Atlantic Ocean. Infrastructure upgrades detailed in the EIS include a new air separation unit and liquefaction plant for on-site liquid oxygen and nitrogen production, reducing dependence on cryogenic deliveries. The report also confirms that a separate catch tower will be built in the previously approved landing zone. Altogether, the FAA and environmental agencies concluded that expanded Starship operations at LC-39A would have no significant environmental impact. However, a final ruling is still pending. The FAA is currently accepting public comments on the draft EIS through online and mail submissions. Public meetings scheduled for late August and early September will provide additional forums for feedback before the final EIS and eventual approval are issued. In a separate development, NASA spaceflight cameras captured heavily damaged Raptor engines arriving on a flatbed truck at SpaceX's McGregor facility, likely recovered from the Ship 36 explosion based on their timing and appearance. These will undergo detailed post-failure analysis. 
Also spotted at McGregor was Raptor engine serial number 580, the highest Raptor V2 serial seen publicly, indicating SpaceX has likely built close to 600 V2 engines so far. This highlights the high production pace enabled by their iterative approach over the past few years. With V2 production nearing its limit, focus is now shifting to Raptor V3, several of which have recently undergone static fire testing at McGregor. Once qualified, these V3s will be shipped to Starbase for integration into upcoming flight hardware. Now, let's discuss the latest updates from the world of science and technology. After months of unsuccessful attempts to restore contact, NASA has officially declared the Lunar Trailblazer mission loss. Selected in 2019 under NASA's Small Innovative Missions for Planetary Exploration Program, the $94 million, 210 kilograms Lunar Trailblazer was a compact spacecraft designed to map water on the moon with high spatial and spectral resolution. Launched on February 26 as a secondary payload aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9, Trailblazer shared the ride with Intuitive Machines' Athena Lunar Lander. It separated from the upper stage 48 minutes after liftoff and ground teams confirmed signal acquisition and a nominal trajectory. The mission had planned a low-energy ballistic transfer, leveraging the combined gravitational influences of the Sun, Earth, and Moon to reach lunar orbit within four to seven months. Once inserted into its science orbit, initially expected between June and September, it was to begin a two-year mission, completing 12 orbits per day to map surface water, mineralogy, and thermal properties, with emphasis on polar regions and permanently shadowed craters where water ice is believed to persist. But the mission took a sharp turn just one day after launch. On February 27, ground controllers lost two-way communication with Trailblazer, halting their ability to command the spacecraft or receive telemetry. Limited data received before the signal loss suggested the solar arrays failed to properly orient toward the sun, likely due to a slow, uncontrolled spin, preventing stable power generation and battery recharge. Without power, the spacecraft couldn't perform the necessary trajectory correction maneuvers and ultimately began drifting into deep space. In response, NASA and its mission partners launched an extensive recovery effort using radar and optical tracking to estimate the spacecraft's attitude and position, hoping intermittent sunlight might recharge the batteries and restore contact. Recovery attempts intensified through June and July, but Trailblazer remained unresponsive. By July 31st, NASA officially ended recovery attempts and declared the mission lost, citing that the spacecraft had drifted too far into deep space for its signals to be received or commanded. Had it reached lunar orbit, Trailblazer would have delivered unprecedented data on the distribution and behavior of lunar volatiles, surface composition, and thermal dynamics. These findings would have directly supported NASA's Artemis program, aided commercial lunar missions, and contributed to our broader understanding of volatile transport and retention mechanisms on airless planetary bodies. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.